So we've had a lot of questions about the upcoming alum treatment for Goose Lake, and we wanted to prepare information for you tonight to help inform any potential restrictions that might be enacted for Goose Lake to protect the alum treatment going forward. So as we get started with this, I would like to remind you that what we're asking as we get through the presentation tonight is a recommendation from you that would go to the city of White Bear Lake as to what you formally would like to see restrictions be on Goose Lake. We also will be requesting your authorization to go forward in submitting the grant proposal. The grant proposal will be going to Bowser. That grant round is opening any day and will be closing by the end of August. So that will be before our next meeting and we'd like to have authorization to go forward to submit, which would not obligate us to accept, but would allow us to go forward. As we've been preparing for tonight and preparing for the grant submission, one of the things Bowser asked was that we consider in advance any potential ordinances that might be in effect to protect the alum treatment on Goose Lake and that we get them in place in advance or at least have the preparation in place that we can cite that in our grant proposal. So we contacted residents living on or very close to the lake. Approximately 47 residents received letters from us in that we explained our plan going forward so far and we asked for their preferences as to what restrictions might be on Goose Lake following the alum treatment. You see the choices here. One is no motorized boating. Two is no large speed boats. Three is a 200 foot no wake zone near the shore with um, no activity the following year. And four is the same no wake zone with no, acti no motorized activity until June of the following year. So those were the options that we presented to the residents. We asked for their feedback, their feedback. All of the comments that we received have been sent to you in advance in the packet in full. And I also have a summary at the end of the slides to explain what we heard back from residents. To provide just a little bit of background, you've heard the studies from the past and what's been going on with Goose Lake, but I want to just keep get us all at a baseline so we're all talking about the same things. What is an alum treatment? An alum treatment is treating the lake with aluminum sulfate. That's called alum. When that's added to the water, then it precipitates out as a flock. The flock initially is loose and fluffy. As that settles to the bottom, it's, it's a very light layer. It takes a while to become more crystalline and settle down into a more solid layer that will be covered up with sediment and a biofilm layer. The biofilm layer is important because that also helps to protect the, the alum layer from being resuspended into the water column, bringing the phosphorus that it contains with it. The quote that I have here, you'll notice some yellow throughout the slides. I've highlighted some of the most important aspects to draw your attention to those, and I will try to also highlight them as we go through. On this particular si slide, you see the spring of 2014 and 2016 highlighted for an alum treatment on Bald Eagle Lake, which is in one of our neighboring watershed districts. They did their treatment in the spring, so that timing is important, I'll come back to that in a moment, of 2014 and 2016. Dosing is a very important issue with shallow lakes, so I'll also come back to that timing, but I just wanna highlight it here on one of our neighbors, that's exactly what they did for putting their alum treatment into their lake. In looking at a review of the literature, we asked what are some of the biggest problems with alum treatment. We know there's a wide variety in how long they last and how well they work, so what affects that? The number one thing for shallow lakes is dosing because shallow lakes have a lower volume. It's very difficult to get the full dose required into the lake at one time because you have to maintain a pH level between six and eight. So if you try to put the entire dose needed based on sediment studies and the dosing required for the lake at once, it's likely to cause a wilder fluctuation in the pH that could be toxic to fish and other aquatic life. So normally what's done for shallow lakes is that that dose is divided into two. That's done in an every other year scenario with a rest year in between to allow the flock to stabilize, to become crystalline, that biofilm layer to um, settle, and also to allow the pH to remain stable. So we're looking at kind of a three to four year window, which is a piece of information that wasn't as clear to a lot of the residents. They may have some questions about that as well. So in yellow here, you have that example. If we do the treatment looking next year in 2020, there would be a rest year after that, 
another dose in 2022 with a rest year after that to get the entire dose successfully in installed into the lake. That's not the only option, but it is the most commonly done one and a conservative one. The pH is acidic. It's the level of acidity. Yep. So I talked about the potential of a fluctuating pH level that could be toxic to aquatic life. So I want to reiterate here that the position from the North American Lake Management Society is that alum is safe and effective as a lake management tool, that alum applications should be designed and controlled to avoid concerns with toxicity to wildlife. So as an alum treatment is administered, pH is carefully monitored. In some examples with other shallow lakes, they have stopped a first dose partway through because they're noticing a change in pH. So this is done carefully with monitoring as it, the alum is being administered. Watershed management is an essential element of protecting and managing our lakes. In cases where watershed phosphorus reductions are neither adequate nor timely, alum is an appropriate tool to ac accomplish meaningful water quality objectives. Often reducing external load or putting BMTs on the landscape in a subshed that has been extensively urbanized is not going to be enough to cause water quality improvements that we're looking for because there is so much historical phosphorus that's already in the lake. And that's especially the case with Goose, Goose Lake because it was receiving wastewater treatment in the 30s and for a number of decades that has allowed a large internal load to be built up, which is a reason why we're looking at the alum treatment to be able to um, ameliorate for that historical impact. And they were so proud of that decision when they put the treatment plant in, they actually thought that that was going to improve the water. Well, because early photographs, I wasn't even, it was, it was more of a drawing, an artist's rendering. It was a marshy area in the late 19th century and became a lake once the water that once the treatment plant was installed. So to that discharging into Yes, to that extent, it did create a lake where there was really more of a marsh in the past. Yeah. So and did not improve water quality at all. Well, I don't, you know, they didn't understand it at the time, right. but they had uh, water though. They had water. Right. It was colored water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Uh, so we know that adaptive management is an important part of conducting an alum treatment. We also know that after that full first dose, which may take place over a couple of years, that might not be it. And so we asked in the literature about what are similar examples and what could we ask about future applications of alum that might be required. The most relevant example I was able to find involves Lake Ketchum, a small lake in Washington state. They were not able to adequately reduce external load in that lake. So as part of their planning, and this was a lake that also had very frequent extensive toxic algal blooms, 19 weeks per year. So basically the summer season, this was not a recreational lake anymore. And um, they had a, a very high agricultural input coming in from the subshed there. So they said, okay, we're going to do this alum treatment, but we know that that's not going to be enough because we can't remove enough of the external load. So that lake was treated in 2014 and 2015. You can see the volume of alum that was applied in each of those. And for that particular lake, because of the ongoing agricultural source, they looked at about one-tenth of that original treatment, treatment dose and doing that as a maintenance dose annually. We do not have a case that's nearly that extreme, but some have asked, well, if we need to continue to do maintenance doses, what might they look like? They're going to be a very small fraction of an initial dose. To come back to the process just a little bit more, as we're talking about the flock and what that flock looks like, to give you an idea of what, why it needs to settle, the particular example that I have here is from wastewater treatment with ferric chloride, but you get the idea of what happens. As the alum is applied to the water, it's first dispersed in the water column. It's going to settle slowly, so we've got a cloudy mixture. As it settles to the bottom, it's going to be that fluffy flock that eventually will form a layer on the bottom. And because this is part of wastewater treatment, that layer was removed in the end, so you've got clear water at the end, but we would end up with a thin layer on the bottom of the lake that becomes more stable with age. How stable does it become with age? That's something that has been looked at in the literature, both in lakes through time and in lab studies. And that biofilm does a very good job of protecting that layer, but it is also important not to excessively disturb the lake sediment. How long does it take for the biofilm layer to form? 
That is two to four months in optimal conditions, which means growing season, summer months. So as we are talking about optimal timing for the alum treatment, that becomes an important variable in the equation. That flock layer becomes more stable with age, but the phosphorus re release is still possible with sediment disturbance. And there's been a lot of question because people have been going back to some of the same key papers that were done in the 90s, but a tremendous amount of work has been done with alum treatments in shallow lakes. So we do know that that disturbance of the sediment does cause phosphorus to be taken back up into the water column and that that phosphorus can be used by algae for, for growth. I've got a note here in front of me. Particulate phosphorus versus soluble reactive phosphorus are the two differences that we're looking at. Particulate phosphorus is less bioreactive. Soluble reactive phosphorus is the most reactive. So that flock layer that has locked the phosphorus into it has a lot of particulate phosphorus, much more than soluble reactive phosphorus, but resuspending it into the water column is still a problem. Timing of treatment. We've had lots of questions about when would an optimal time be to do the treatment. Normally spring is the best time to do an alum treatment because a lot of vegetation in the lake will get in the way of a nice even layer of alum settling in and landing on the bottom of the lake. But in Goose Lake, we just had a survey done, a vegetation survey. We know that we have very low plant biomass at this time because the algae is the dominant um, structure in that lake, which causes a turbid condition that doesn't allow plants to grow efficiently. And in the survey that was done by Ramsey County Soil and Water Conservation Division, they had 94 points on East Goose Lake, and they were all devoid of plants. So because of that, Bar Engineering has said that a fall treatment, at least initially, would be okay in East Goose Lake because there is not a an extensive amount of vegetation that would likely get in the way. In the future, if we do this first dose of alum treatment, we do expect Natural. plant growth mm -hmm. in the lake and water clarity. As that happens, we would probably need to look at spring treatments, and we've seen that in other lakes where they did an initial spring a fall treatment, and then the, the sequential treatments were in the spring. What's the sand photo? We have optimal conditions in the lake is that we're taking good care of the shoreline, that we're taking good care of the wetlands that are also filtering the water that's coming in. And we have some other issues on Goose Lake where we have a fairly steady delivery of sand that is coming onto the shoreline there and being deposited into the lake. There's also gravel that's increasing the grade in the parking lot to try to um, improve some water issues during stormwater events, but that gravel is being pushed into the wetland. So there are some issues going on right on the shoreline that are affecting quality of the lake. Is that picture West Goose Lake, mm -hmm. though? That's West. These are on West. Okay. <clears throat> but this doesn't add any phosphorus, does it, sand? Particulates can carry phosphorus. It's oh. usually bound to sediment. Okay, thank you. We've also had questions about the cost for the alum treatment for when the original study was done, the bid was calculated for East Goose and West Goose and Oak Knoll Pond. And we are now looking at only treating East Goose because that is our most import impaired water body. It has the highest levels of phosphorus and that allows accommodation of continued water skiing on West Goose Lake. So we're looking at a total cost of about $170,000, which is a significant inv investment and why we're going out for grant funding to help support that. And I thought it might be helpful to see from the literature that alum is 50 times more effective in removing phosphorus per dollar than BMP measures in urban lakes. So the literature is telling us that this is a very effective tool and a very cost effective tool. There have also been questions about the effect on property value and that if we do an alum treatment and that limits activity on the lake, motorboat activity on the lake, that that might be an economic loss. And according to the, the literature as of 2009, so 10 years ago, $2.2 billion annually in the U.S. is lost as a result of eutrophication. And the primary portion of that is lakefront property values. So money lost because of poor water quality like we have in East Goose Lake. There's a lot we can learn from alum treatments that have been done through history. They started in the 70s, so we've got 50 years, basically, of alum treatments that we can learn from. 
Lots of them don't end up in the literature because they aren't part of scientific studies, but at least 250 treatments have been done worldwide that have ended up in the literature. 114 were looked at in a recent review paper that included 24 lakes in Minnesota. So we've got a lot of alum treatments going on in our part of the world. Dosing is the number one issue in effectiveness, and benthic feeding fish is the second risk in effectiveness of the alum treatments. That was primarily due to the presence of car carp, which muck up the bottom. We don't have carp in East Goose, but we do have bullheads, so we want to address that. A lot of People have asked, well, how long is this likely to last? The mean treatment is 11 years up to 15 years, and that is grouping shallow lakes and deep lakes. When we look at only shallow lakes, we have a mean of 5.7 years up to 14 to 16 years. This isn't only done in other parts of Minnesota. In Minneapolis, they treated the chain of lakes. That was done in 97 and 2001. And they had positive effects still resulting in their shallow lake, lake of the Isles, 14, nine years out, nine years out. And the city of Minneapolis looked at limiting activity to protect their alum treatments and also to protect their lakes, including shoreline stability. And they decided to go with non-motorized use on those lakes. They allow electric motors only. Any gas motors have to be out of the water. Uh, can you go back? I'm confused. They're, they still have props, so I'm not... An electric motor still has a prop. So are, if, I think it's the speed uh, that they can go. Yeah, torque. And, oh, because <laughs> they're still, they would still be disturbing the water. But it would be really hard to pull skier behind a <laughs> Minnesota. Yeah. Amount of disturbance does correlate Sorry. to horsepower, and electric motors are going to generate a lower horsepower. So I've got that coming up in a slide in just a moment. Spring Lake has recently finished their alum treatments. They are a deep lake. So they did a full dose in one year. They did a dose in 2013 and 2018. They're having really terrific results from it. They have a quote from a resident here that says the water quality is amazing. We were swimming. I couldn't believe how good it looked. So people have been very happy with the results there. The Watershed District has been very happy with their results as well. So it's even working in deep lakes? Where, that one. When there's a turn? That particular one is in a, in a deep lake. But there, there would be a turn, a normal turning of a rollover? Yeah. Well, Mixing of the lake, yep, yeah. and it's stratified in the summer months, yep. And stratified lakes tend to be more effective with alum treatments too. Polymictic is when they're mixing multiple times throughout the year. Um, that is more of a problem for alum treatments in shallow lakes. <coughs> so I said dosing was the number one concern. Bioturbation is the number two concern in effectiveness in shallow lakes, and part of that can come from benthic feeding fish. We know that there are bullheads in East Goose Lake, and Vlamo has been preparing for this over a number of years. So there was a removal that was done in 2012. There were 80 black bullhead per net. In 2017, there were 22 black bullhead per net. There's been a reduction by 75% of the biomass of bullheads that are in East Goose Lake. And that report is posted on our website. If anyone has questions, they can go and see the scientific conclusions that I have summarized right here. We wanted to know more about water skiing specifically because we know that that is an issue on East Goose Lake and that we have stakeholders that value that recreational use strongly. So we wanted to ask about other lakes around that may have done alum treatments and what that meant for water skiing. And we don't have good news for you. But we have an example on Half Moon Lake in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. They are very similar lakes. Half Moon is 132 acres. Goose Lake is 120 acres. Half Moon is 9 feet deep. Goose Lake is a maximum of 7.4 feet deep. They're both hypereutrophic. They have an internal load from historical sources. They have a presence, and Half Moon actually had a far greater density of curly leaf pondweed. And they have a ski team that both practices and does shows. They had a ski team that practiced and did shows on Half Moon Lake. So the research there looked specifically at the impact on, and sediment disruption of motorboats. And they acknowledged that boating activity was the hardest to measure and the least predictable. So they made that very clear from their literature, but they did document their sources of phosphorus loading in the water column, and they had 42% that was internal load that was primarily historical as a logging area. So there's a lot of um, sunken debris in that lake. 20% decomposition from curly leaf and 17% from motorboat activity. It was hard to model what was going on with the motorboats, but they didn't stop there. They looked and measured dissolved oxygen, phosphorus, and turbidity directly at the ski jump and at other locations moving away from ski activity on the lake. They found that the water was fully mixed only at the jump site, 
At all other sites, the sediment remained anoxic, means without oxygen, and that's important because when it's anoxic right above the sediment, that's when phosphorus is released into the water column, stimulating growth of algae and plant matter. That also meant that the lake was weaker stratified, especially at the jump site because of the mixing that was occurring, and m more strongly stratified lakes are more effective for alum treatments. It's that mixing that's allowing the oxygen to be fully mixed into the water, the phosphorus to be constantly mixed into the water column that causes a lot of problems for algae going forward. I mentioned the difference between the particulate phosphorus and the biosoluble reactive phosphorus earlier, so I won't go into that in detail here, but they found that particulate phosphorus was primarily um, resuspended by the motorboat activity, and that is not as readily available for to stimulate algae growth, but that it does stimulate algae growth as well, not as much. They did their alum treatments in 2011 and 2017, and I could find that really well in the literature. And I also had a report that said that they had limited ski activity, but I didn't know what that meant. So I contacted the managers there and said, what happened? Because I also found a note in their city council report that said that the ski team had been relocated to Lake Altoona in 2007. Their alum treats were, treatments were done in 2011 and 2017. So I said, why did that happen, and is practice still allowed on the lake? And they said that motorboat activity has been determined to disrupt the layer of alum on lake sediments, encouraging the release of phosphorus, so no internal combustion engines are allowed on Half Moon Lake mm -hmm. unless associated with research studies. So they didn't come back? They did not come back. They were relocated to Lake Altoona, and they do not practice on that lake anymore either. Okay. I found another study that was a little bit older from 97, but looked at two lakes that were the same in every way that they could manage, so they were trying to rule out confounding variables except the amount of motorboat activity. They found that the differences were pretty dramatic. On the boating lake, there was increased turbidity, algae cover was significant, odor was detected, phosphorus increased significantly, significantly. And there was wind activity, which is always brought up with polymictic lakes. Wind is doing a lot of the mixing, but the direct cause of mixing here was motorboat activity. All of the references from the PowerPoint are included in the PowerPoint that will be made available to the board. It will be posted on our website. It will be made available to the City of White Bear Lake, and they are also available on handouts over on the table over there. There's a summary from the slides and the literature review, so you're welcome to take that with you. If you have questions from any of the papers, we certainly invite you to go and find them on the, the table right here, yeah, closest to me. That paper provided a piece of inf interesting information. We had questions about horsepower and boats and what does that mean for mixing of the sediment. We know that there are a lot of variables with that, but this particular study cited horsepower at 10, 28, and 50 and looked at mixing 5.9 feet, 9.8 feet, 15.1 feet, and of course we have a very shallow lake with East Goose at 7.4 feet. How did you find this? This is pretty amazing information. Thank um, you. Well. <laughs> Well, we have a scientist working for us now. It wasn't easy. A professor. <laughs> but, you know, this is well done. Oh, thank Continue, you. please. Thank you. So when they compared their boating activity versus their non-boating activity, they felt that motorboat activity had sufficient impacts and disrupted the bottom sediment, released phosphorus and other nutrients into the overlying water. Wisconsin legislature has also done a lot of work. This is in white papers and testimonies to, instead of in peer-reviewed literature, but they've looked a lot at boating impacts for Wisconsin lakes in de determining no wake zones. And they've determined that bo boat wakes cause shoreline erosion, they increase turbidity, the, the turbulence is most pronounced, and the effects are most extreme on shallow lakes. Shallow lakes, with, that are less than 10 feet deep are most susceptible, and we know that we have a very shallow lake. The boating activity can also spread invasive species, and we have curly leaf, which we have a vegetation plan and a revegetation permit in place. We know that we're gonna need to do a lot of work to establish native species, and we do want to prevent movement of curly leaf into East Goose more extensively than it is. We have reports of it being at the culverts. Ramsey County was also doing polygons for us of the extent of curly leaf in East and West Goose. We're gonna be reporting those back to DNR as soon as we have the reports back. We have preliminary information in. The full reports will probably be a few weeks yet. We had some comments that said, why don't we just leave this alone and move on? 
and we know that we have a really problematic lake and we have very extreme phosphorus levels in this lake. If we decide to just not do anything, we have the potential for extreme toxic algae blooms becoming more frequent, and those have risks to humans, although severe risks to humans have been rarely, document, but rarely documented, but we also have likely deaths or possible deaths to pets, and livestock is a possibility, not so much in our watershed, but also one that's documented. We are in an urban center. We have impacts of climate change. We know that we have warming going on, and so these algae blooms are likely to increase without intervention. that has potential effects to drinking water. East Goose is the headwaters that's flowing into East Vadnais, which is our drinking water reservoir, so that is a concern to us. They also have effects to ecology in addition to the health and potential effects to wildlife that I mentioned already. The pictures in the, I should mention on this slide, the ones at the bottom are ones that I took from the internet, but the ones on the side are from East Goose Lake from monitoring from Blummo. So Goose Lake is the most impaired lake in our watershed. It's highly visible in White, White Bear Lake, even though it doesn't have public water access. And I've at least been able to find online that a lot of people do know about different access areas where they do fishing. It's a priority in our comprehensive water plan. And six years of extensive study, drainage work, bullhead harvest have got us to this point where we're proposing an alum treatment that has been um, well supported with the research and the studies that have been done in the lake. The graph that you probably can't read on the bottom shows the phosphorus loads in East and West Goose Lake starting in 2007, going through 2016, and the levels are getting up to around 340 micrograms per liter with an average of around 255. The standard is 60. It's really high. It's full of phosphorus. We know that an alum treatment by itself is not going to fix the lake. It's going to need continued adaptive management. We're prepared and we have built steps to allow us to do that. So what do residents want? We sent out the letter. We asked what residents want. I went over the options to you at the beginning. You can see how residents responded. We've got those here, and you also had these in advance in your packet. The favored option was a no-wake zone with no boating until June of the following year, and part of that option also involved increased monitoring so that restrictions could increase if they were needed and if phosphorus levels were seen to be increasing. Can, can you go back to that slide again? When yeah, you, sure can. You're saying no boating. That's just no power. Boat, no power is no motorized boating was one option. Oh, canoes, kayaks, yep. okay. And nobody picked that one. No large speed boats. One of our board members had suggested that if we had um, boats at a certain horsepower, that would be an ordinance that would be easier to enforce. That also wasn't very popular. The no wake zone is thought to be the most difficult to enforce, and we know that the likely disturbance to the sediment is likely to be a problem to the alum treatment. No, no, that any water forward. enforcement would be Ramsey County, correct? Ramsey County Sheriff's Department? Would do Department. enforcement. Yeah. Uh, I don't think they would be <laughs> too inclined to go try to drop a boat in that lake. Well, they can't get the boat in there anyway. So, yeah. <coughs> there's no... No, there, there's no... Ramp? No, there's no... No, no public access. East Goose. So these are the four options that we offered to residents. There are residents here that might like an opportunity to voice their thoughts and concerns. The summary from the slides is over there. Everybody is welcome to take that. Again, we'll be making all of this information available to you, and we are requesting direction from the board to go to the city of White Bear Lake as to what you feel the best ordinance would be on limiting activity on the lake. And we're also seeking authorization to go forward to submit the grant for the alum treatment. Okay, well, thank you for the presentation. Mm -hmm.